um, yeah, hi, my name is Nick Gravely. And uh, as Daniela says, uh, for the last 20 or so years, I've been um, offering design sculpture services to the automotive industry, primarily the motorcycle industry. Um, and yeah, over the last couple of years, really, I've also started teaching uh, Gravity Sketch um, as well. And yeah, so basically, this is kind of what my job has looked like for the last 20 years, uh, modeling stuff in clay. Uh, I've been able to work with some fantastically creative people. And uh, yeah, it's, it's no, never really seemed like a job, to be honest. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've had a, a huge amount of fun. But um, I mean, the reason why we do these clay models really is because um, the automotive industry has to spend uh, quite a lot of money developing these these vehicles and, and for them to have, to have a, um, a kind of uh, a commercial failure is a very expensive thing and so they want to make sure that they can really um, make sure that these things look exactly uh, the way they want before they industrialize them uh, and put them out into the marketplace um, so why clay well the thing is if, if you if you if you model something and it, it, it it's a flop. Uh, it, you know, it costs a lot of money, uh, and it hasn't really changed at all over the last uh, 90 years. So it was, in, you know, kind of invented in GM in the 30s, uh, and it hasn't really changed a huge amount. It's still basically um, a an ideas guy and a sculpt, a design sculptor like me, working together to 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 find the uh, the ultimate shape. And uh, and yes. Yeah, so there's this kind of back and forth that happens, you know, where the designer will, will express himself through knife lines and tape lines, as, as Matt Bentley from Zero Motorcycles is doing here in this in this image. And, uh, and yeah, and so we'll really do a lot of problem solving together uh, to figure out exactly uh, what needs to be done and how to and how to do it. And um, it's really great for the designer because he can actually work with a, with a craftsman um, such as myself uh, in order to, to achieve that. There are some some downfalls, of course, that it's um, that it's kind of a messy process. Uh, it's kind of labor intensive, um, also, uh, which means it's uh, expensive, and um, and also, whilst the rest of the uh, the industry has kind of become digital, so so sketching has become digital with Photoshop, and engineering has become digital. Um, there's really clay modeling is kind of this is become this uh, sort of uh, indulgent, not 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 so much indulgent, but uh, this very uh, old school process that which kind of exists on its own um and uh yeah so it's not really uh, a surprise that uh, the automotive industry has been trying to push uh push digital processes into this kind of uh, aesthetic uh form finding uh area um so now what, what actually what what has happened really is that uh so we've gone from this uh, really amazing way of a designer and a sculptor working together to find uh, form to actually two people sitting next to a monitor, uh, sitting next to one another and talking and, you know, the, trying to create a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional screen with only a single perspective at any one time, um, you know, only one person being able to make input. And um, so it's it's really kind of a, for me it's a backward step uh, in that communication uh, of, of, in that collaboration. Um, there have of, of course been benefits like being able to import uh, the latest uh, engineering package at any one time uh, or exporting the the latest surfaces to the engineering team. Um, and yeah, those are great advantages of, of digital. But I, I feel that the trade-off uh, has been really to sacrifice every single benefit that has that has existed uh, in clay modeling um, up until now. And so, uh, and potentially, the worst part about it is uh, no longer being able to leverage the uh, the skills of those um, those clay modelers who have spent you know tens of thousands of hours uh, building fi building real things in the real world. Um, really understand like learning about surfaces learning how one thing changes everything around it how you know how those forms work how the how the each surface proportion of that against the next area of the each each patch works in concert to create the entire vehicle uh, and 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 that removal of that skill has, has been to the great detriment of the automotive industry uh, in my opinion um because you know when when they hit the button and they 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 mill out what was actually um you know what they've seen on the screen 
uh, invariably it's a tremendous surprise to everyone and they yeah okay then they have to go back into digital change some of the stuff and then they remill it out and they chuck a load more clay milling uh clay that's milled off on the floor and they just chuck that into the bin um and it's this kind of like going around the houses trying to circle in on the uh on the final form and uh yeah it's 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 not very efficient but it does plug in well to uh or better to the uh to the digital other digital digital processes um so i've always i've always been out i've always been very cognizant of the of this kind of distance between physical modeling and digital modeling and um and actually it was when i went to california to go and work on on these two motorcycles the zero srf and the srs um that uh, i was fortunate that because they don't have any legacy processes, um, I was actually able to uh, institute some solutions uh, that were uh, that would would kind of reduce this uh, this distance that's uh, that's always been there. You know, it wasn't just a, an amazing project because my family and I went off to go and spend the summer in 2017 in California, living in a beautiful little beach house, uh, which was fantastic. Um, but basically, the you know a couple of a couple of technological leaps were made. Um, and I'm not sure I was aware of it really at the time, but but now in retrospect, they were really um, they really yeah were technological leaps. Um, the the first one was to actually institute the use of uh, like a, a handheld scanner uh, like this one. This one's a Peel Two uh, from Peel 3D, and um, I got to say thank you very much to Francoise from Peel Peel 3D for his continued support of me. Uh, I use this in my pro in my process all the time whenever I'm doing clay models now. Because it means what I can do is I can, we can model something and we can scan really quickly in like 10, 15 minutes, take that, snap it to some known uh, coordinates in uh, over the engineering package and really understand where our clay surfaces are relative to the, to the engineering surfaces. And, uh, and also we can output those surfaces to engineering or, or anyone who wants to see them. Um, and it was the second, it, that, that brings me on to the second uh, leap, which was to actually be able to uh, put on a VR headset for the first time. And uh, the digital modeler there at Zero, Alan Valencia, he actually took one of these scans and he dropped it over the, uh, over the latest package and he, he cut, the, cut my scan up into the different components and added texture and color. And suddenly I could see for the very first time in VR, uh, in v, rendered in VRED, actually what the clay I'd been working on really, really looked like with that color breakup. And typically, the only way we would ever be able to see color breakup before was to do something like this. So we had the clay model and we used this stretchy film called Dynock and we put, we'd stretch it over the surface. And then you see kind of a little bit better uh, what it looks like with the, with the correct color breakup. But really, um, this is not, you know, if you, if you see something and say, ah, oh, no, I want to change it. You know, you have to take the dynoc off to make the change. Well, you know, in gravity sketch and VR modeling, we can we can actually just, uh, you know, update. Um, we can work on it, you know, in real time. So it's uh, that's pretty pretty amazing. Um, so, but yeah, so the so the the seeing in VR was it was a really pivotal moment for me, and that was back in two two thousand seventeen. Um, gravity sketch instituted sub D in two thousand nineteen, I believe, uh, and then. In 2020, uh, that is when the uh, the Quest 2 uh, was launched by Oculus, uh, and um, yeah, so I bought that as soon as that came out, and it's been it's been a real life changer for me to be uh, to be absolutely honest. Um, yeah, to uh, I, I just kind of bought it to see what was possible, uh, see whether it could plug into the process, and you know what what could be done with it, and. Um, I didn't realize at the time, but it would basically solve a massive pain point that I was having, um, which was because my young family was now suddenly, you know, getting to the school age uh, and couldn't travel and, you know, travel around the world with me anymore. They were having to stay at home, but I had to balance my need to kind of go out and earn money with my desire to be at home with my family. Um, and so suddenly with VR, I actually no longer have to travel anymore. And I know this is a this is a thing that many many uh, freelance clay modelers have to contend with is this kind of balancing act of of, of home life and, and working. And um, yeah, this is this has been a huge uh, life change for me. And you know, I just feel that I'm so so lucky. Um, you know, I, every day I can do my work. I can go mountain biking with my dog. I can see my family. I can have dinner with my family every night. Um, just just incredible. Just feel feel so so lucky. Um, and, you know, 
on top of that, the reason you know the reason is because you know this is how now we communicate. So so this is very very much like uh, uh, a clay modeling process. So I never went through a through digital like flat monitored digital modeling. It was never an attractive proposition for me because you know I'm a three dimensional creative to to try and make me create in a two dimensional uh, environment. It, it's a backward step for me. So, but this is kind of how it is. So you see uh, my buddy here, Fabian, and I working on the light fighter race bike, and he's kind of pulling in, he's pulling in lines here. Um, and so, you know, now what was a knife line and tape lines on a clay model has now become, you know, ink lines and stroke lines. So, um, so we communicate in this way and we can, we still feel the we still feel the presence of the model in front of us. Um, we still feel, the, the presence of each other, uh, we, can, we don't have to, uh, we're not beholden to putting a, a tape on an existing surface. Now, uh, Fabienne or I, we can just make lines in, in three dimensions. Uh, the, the sort of uh, air tapes that, uh, that uh, if, you're a clay, if you've ever worked on a clay model, you'll, you'll be familiar with putting a blob of clay on a corner and stretching a tape across it. And um, yeah, so this is no longer an issue anymore. And this is the moment I really wanted to play you a video, which is a which is an excerpt uh, from the uh, from the Fate Makers podcast, which was uh, which is a Frank Stephenson uh, podcast where he's interviewing Achim Anscheid, who's the uh, design director of Bugatti. And uh, you know, probably if you're watching this in uh, later edit, we'll, we'll we'll drop the video in right here. If you think about you know uh, measuring plates, measuring arms. Space, clay ovens, you know, and now having to protect uh, from the smells. Uh, Health and safety. <laughs> uh, then five five clay modelers around the uh, around the car uh, goes ching ching ching. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, building up the frame for a two ton clay model, you know, has to be rock solid, uh, and then everything on top of that, and then the clay, and then milling that, and then the in and out and back and forth. It takes a long time and it costs a lot of money. And by the time I have a somewhat, in, in the classic process, I would say to have a somewhat reliable uh, um, surface on, on a clay model or something that you like, you probably have spent already four to 500,000 euro. Uh, so for a long time, I didn't have much budget, uh, pretty much zero budget in the design studio. And that brought us into working much heavier in VR. It, it is a disadvantage now to actually do it the conservative way with a classic clay model. Now, I, I can be quite a bit faster. Uh, I can also uh, do my work on a, on a smaller budget or use budget and for something else in my process. And I don't have the feeling I'm losing quality because the VR image by now, and this only happened in the last three to four years now, is so good that you really have the feeling you are looking at a real car. It's like a real car. It's really not much off. And then when we are somewhat satisfied, then we push the button and we do a, a hard model immediately, transparent, um, and we have it sitting there. Uh, but then it's not a big surprise actually from the system to, to come there. Because you know how it was still some 10 years ago. You were looking at a cat screen, but what you saw then in the yard uh, was different, you know, all of a sudden the sunlight hits this thing and looks different and you go around it in three quarter view and things are not the same way as you saw it on the CAD system. In this process, okay, now clay modelers in a way translated became VR modelers. Uh, you still need experts uh, in that field. Maybe the next step there that you can actually do it in real time. Or in real time, that's with gravity. Fully shaded, everything, and you're just pulling pulling the lines right there and, and the surface is, is immediately adjusting to that now. It feels like a real car. Really, really feels like the presence. Uh, I mean, this uh, this kind of might look like a, a joke image or something, but it really, really feels like uh, the, 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 the thing is right there in front of you. And um, yeah, so he's he's experienced the uh, the speed gains, and they did this uh, the Devo in six months. They did the Mistral in nine months, uh, and saved a huge amount of time, huge amount of money. Um, I, I think he talks about like savings of from, from a clay model, he would be four to five hundred thousand uh, euros to build a clay model, uh, and these are like less than half that cost. Um, and I, I presume because Bugatti is a very very tight package, they kind of experience the same benefits that I feel uh, of experience with motorcycles because motorcycles are a very tight, tightly packaged uh, engineering and, you know, you've got the ergonomics of the rider as well. And so, um, yeah, this is to be able to integrate all those engineering and, and ergonomic issues uh, and they'll, they'll have aerodynamic issues, of course, as well. Um, it's really such a powerful thing. 
he talks about also that uh, clay modeling had experts and in VR modeling, you also need experts. And uh, so what is an expert? So, you know, you can see here a pencil, it depends who's holding the pencil, uh, depending on what comes out. You know, you can give a lump of clay to a three-year-old child, five-year-old child, whatever, and they'll make something with it. But you give that same lump of child to someone who understands form uh, and how to use it in a precise way, and they can actually they can actually create tremendously precise output. And you know, the same goes for um, for VR modeling. So this is uh, this is uh, my daughter and I since I bought the the Quest Pro, uh, which uh, I may or may not keep because it's kind of uncomfortable to be quite honest. Um, but um, but since we now have two headsets, my daughter she can play in Gravity Sketch and she. Uh, she does some stuff there, some some quite basic stuff in Gravity Sketch. But when I'm working in Gravity Sketch, I can make really, really beautifully precise um, surfaces there, and uh, you know, use them to actually um, output to into the real world. So we, you know, we can go from we go from a sketch, and we we pull the line work in around that sketch. Uh, we can do a lot of the design editing just with the line work because uh, we can infer the surfaces that that, that exist between those uh, between those surface breaks, skin it up with surfaces, and and then go straight into uh, a real life uh, motorcycle right there. So there was there was no clay process in this. Although I do advocate if there is a budget that yeah definitely we should uh, mill out a clay uh, and check it and sit on it and and all these kind of things. Um, so let me just look at my notes. Um, so yeah, so the thing is that I'm not I'm very I'm very optimistic about VR. Like I understand that that there's some there is some resistance uh, from the industry. Some people see it as just a toy. Um, I don't see it that way. But uh, the problem is trying to convince them of that. And that, you know there are certain people who are able to be convinced of that. And there are certain people who are very, very against it. And, and, I, and I, from what I hear, some of the larger OEMs uh, really are not ever going to embrace it anytime soon. And that's okay. They will eventually. They'll have to um, because, you know, the smaller companies that are able to uh, operate a little bit more, you know, change direction a little bit more quickly, use innovative uh, technologies in their processes. And, you know, these are the guys that are going to make it really, really uh, penetrate the, the industry. Um so I'm not. I'm optimistic about it becoming a question of if, not when. And we're really, really at the ground floor of this right now. Um, you know, this is. I've only been using it for two years, and already it's basically all but uh, replaced most of the clay modeling work I do, like 90% of the form finding uh, clay modeling. And um, you know, watching uh, Constantina's presentation of Constantina from, from Kadim, her presentation yesterday um, about how. You know, she can create three-dimensional meshes that we could then bring into Gravity Sketch. Um, that's really uh, exciting. You know, I've been talking to uh, another company about how we might be able to take these, um, like these, this line work, these, these kind of line work, and then auto use AI to actually auto complete the surfaces. Because uh, really, when I'm when I'm doing the surfaces for this, I now I understand how to build the topology. It really feels like an algorithm just process of just skinning it up and it's really a fast thing this is 100 percent something that could be done by ai so if anyone's working on something like that uh, and they would like to talk about that i would really love to talk to you about that too um so yeah so so where are we at now so in order to make uh, this happen you know my goal really is to try and create a movement uh in my industry so uh and i don't think it's really coming too much from the industry side i think what needs to happen is to is to train up uh some of these uh clay modelers who actually recognize that their career is um not what it once was now you know they they're having to spend all their time milling up cl clay uh, clayed uh, milling up milled clay models and uh, there's no satisfaction, I don't think, in that. It's not a creative process. It's just, it's just a process. You know, it's just cleaning up clay models, putting dino on. It's, it's not terribly interesting. And from people, for people who actually, you know, love the creative process, the creative collaboration, which I love, um, yeah, this is not really a, a good enough thing. So some of these guys, like these guys, for instance, and uh, these are just some of my students. Um, 
are you know picking up uh, Gravity Sketch, and Gravity Sketch have been amazing in supporting uh, me with this uh, by sending headsets to some of these guys. So you know, thank you Gravity Sketch for your you know not just creating just the most incredible tool, but but actually you know supporting me in my efforts to to create this movement. Um, and uh, yeah, th so these guys are looking forward to a revitalization of, of their careers. And uh, yeah, I'm really you know I love the work that I do. Uh, but, you know, it's really gratifying for me as I kind of get older to try and look for a bigger purpose, uh, try to make some difference in people's lives um, and, and kind of give, give, pay, for, pay, pay, pay forward some of the amazing luck and, and joy that I've had um, up until now. So I guess uh, just real quickly, I'll just sum up very, very quickly some of the benefits here. So like for clay modelers, you know, there's no longer the need to travel. You can, you can work from anywhere. You, you you don't ha you don't any longer have to uh, do like boring work uh, like just cleaning up clay models. You can actually get back in and do creative collaboration. For designers, you now are able to get back into this kind of, once again also into this kind of collaboration. But you're able to um, leverage the, the 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 skills that the craftsmen had, the, the craftsmen that you always relied on when they were clay modeling, and have now been basically removed from the process and that move to flat monitor you know alias uh, concept modeling and such like that now you can you can leverage those skills once again um you know you've got a seamless input and output to engineering so you can be part of those uh, problem solving get the engineers in you know they, you can stick your head inside the model look really okay you know brackets and such like or hey here's a tube we need more clearance for this and there's this, you can really be part of that conversation in a really um, kind of tangible way um, because ultimately we're all working together to make products um, you know we're all swimming in the same direction uh, and so we can you know, how we can help the people downstream is, is also majorly beneficial and I think engineering you probably uh, you know will see massive benefits of this too you know because you're able to get great surfaces out and, uh, and also feedback information so it kind of tightens up the the loop between design uh, or aesthetic design and engineering and then last of all you know it's a benefit for studios because you're not having to mill out every you know every couple of days you're not milling out loading up with with expensive clay milling off that clay you know picking it up and chucking it in the bin um, so there's less clays. Suddenly you can access global talent anybody who with an internet connection and a VR headset and the skills can work on your projects um and uh and so yeah so this it's just it's so it, it, it's almost difficult for me to sell this like i was down at, in uh, the eichmann motorcycle show at the beginning of this week talking to people about this and it almost it seems just too good to be true but it really really just it, it is this good um and so um i'm really hopeful that with these guys um learning gravity sketch and more guys learning gravity sketch that we're going to be able to show industry hey there's a there's a resource here now you can start to use it um and um yeah i think together we can all kind of make a movement and and, and make this make this happen so uh yeah i really appreciate your attention i think that's about it uh if anyone's got any questions then uh, i guess i'll take them uh now maybe i have to stop sharing do i have to stop sharing my thing um, okay. No, we can keep it. I mean, as you wish, Nick. If you I'll want just to stay here. It. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to turn the light on there. Sorry, I'm <laughs> losing. I might lose tracking. Okay. All right. Um, and then I'll bring Nico and Neo to stage so they can answer the ask questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy to be seeing a presentation like this. Um, and and. And I mean, besides that, uh, listening to you speak about something that it's quite kind of like traditional and just seeing how you are opening up to, to a less traditional way. Um, all right. So yeah. Nico and Nemo are here now and there are our guests for asking questions. So I'll, I'll open the mic for Nico and Nemo. Welcome, guys. Um, Hello. Hey. <laughs> All right. So mine is not really a question, um, but more of a comment because um, some aspect of our uh, experience in our journey with VR is similar. And, and the way um, 
I've sort of framed it, uh, which again, very similar to what you've done in your presentation was great, by the way. Um, but I've, I've thought of it in the terms of if you streamline your workflow and your process, not only for your design team, like your core team, but also for the stakeholders with digital iteration and then analog validation. And so I'd like you, you to maybe comment on that and expand if you, if you, if you could. Yeah, so, I mean, so if I understood correctly, you're saying um, that, uh, yeah, we do this development in digital, but then mill out the clay for, for validation. And um, I mean, right. that's typically how we how we work is, you know, certainly for a motorcycle to, to be able to mill that out. Like we can get a basic idea of, of by importing a mannequin and putting the mannequin in the riding position. And can, we can see whether there's a, a sharp edge on the, of the a panel gap. Uh, or, or sorry, uh, two panels joining we might create a sharp edge for the knee. Uh, and we're always going to have to mill that out um, and sit on it and really feel uh, whether it is okay. I mean, before we go into, into industrialization, there has to be that kind of analog validation. I don't know really for the automotive industry, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really so used to or um, versed in, in what, happens in the automotive industry, but I'm sure it's quite similar. They, they, they want to kind of feel that presence. But I would think for me, it's really important for my industry because there is such a kind of an interaction between the human and the machine. Whereas for me, a, a, a vehicle is kind of more, it's more like it's just an object, you know? And, yeah. uh, and I think, you know, if you've got like a, like a Vario XR3 or something, you know, which would be amazing. I've never tried one, but Vario, if yeah. you're listening, I would love to try one. <laughs> um, um, you know, whether, whether, whether the actual, what you're seeing is beyond optical resolution. So you can trick yourself into believing that it's real. Then, yeah, I, you know, I don't know whether the, I, I maybe, you know, a few more years down the road, we, we don't even need the analog, um, validation. Do, I mean, do, do, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So the analog validation comes into play, um, so I'm, I'm in automotive primarily, but I'm also in greater product design. I've done various different uh, types of products, everything from um, like simple household products um, all the way up to automotive and uh, everything in between. And basically one, one thing that I feel that VR is vitally missing, but I know it's coming in the pipeline is that, that tangible feel. So for instance, uh, let's use motorcycle. I've done a motorcycle as well. Uh, just one. <laughs> so not as much experience, mm -hmm. but this is uh, something that you could probably relate to when you test in VR uh, and you have such tight ergonomic constraints. The one thing you can't test is like when you grab the handlebars, if there's a hot spot on your palm or, you know, being able to actuate some of those mechanical details that are so vital that you need the analog presence after you've already made a ton of design decisions in, in the digital space. And, and so that's why I say, you know, analog validation. But if you had a tool that could, that could simulate that, what do you think that could do for, for the process? I mean, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you had a tool that could simulate that, yeah. I mean, now we get, we're getting into um, Ready Player Two territory, maybe even. So I don't know if you've right. read, that, read that book, but like it, basically it's not just watching uh, uh, or seeing things. It, it, you, could, you know, with this, it's like a neural link, so you can actually experience and feel. So maybe there is a, uh, a future where, whereby um, your, you can actually have your touch senses uh, stimulated. Uh, I don't know. This is, I mean, this is science. That's, that's the, the science fiction, but um, I, th I think for now, yeah, being able to validate in analog is really important because yeah, it's 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 all about you know figuring stuff out before you tool up and and, and make stuff. So like, I I don't know what technology is going to be available soon, um, but if there was some way of simulating, of course, that would be worth trying and, and um, sure, yeah. A, a, a quick example of how um, we've done that um, in my experience is uh, we did an interior, for instance, and we mocked mm -hmm. up a buck that was extremely rudimentary, just a bunch of plywood and some buttons where the buttons are supposed to go and the steering wheel where that goes and an adjustable mm -hmm. seat and then put them in the VR with the headset and everything was tangible and analog in, in actual 
reality. And then yes. in VR, it was the simulated UX UI. It was a simulated um, environment uh, to where you're able to make a, a ton of decisions as well as get buy out, uh, buy out on certain features from stakeholders at very, very early processes. Um, have you done anything like that in the motorcycle world, like create sort of a uh, ergonomic buck that, you know, yeah, basically it's looks done. like it's, a sawhorse? It's been done. <laughs> yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been done for sure. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's useful. I mean, any information you can glean is, is useful. Um, but uh, I would say typically, um, like, you know, there's a lot of benchmarking existing vehicles. So you, you know, so yeah. if you say, look here, you know, the Honda, like, so I have a Honda VFR 800. Uh, and to me, this is just like the perfect uh, motorcycle ergonomics. And, you know, I would just, so we could scan, you know, we can just scan that and bring that in and know that we can simulate that and, and so, or copy that and say, okay, that's perfect. Um, you know, we haven't done that, but, but just for an example, there's an awful lot of benchmarking that goes on. I think the, I think, I think what is really, really necessary is really the understanding of the finer details, like the really how you know how the angle of the fuel tank is and how that mm -hmm. curvature plays with, with you. Um, definitely, you know, you can get some sense of it by making an ergonomics buck, um, but it's but that's very early, and that's you know you'll make those kind of ergonomics decisions really early down uh, uh, about like what the bike is supposed to be, what you know what's the benchmarked uh, ergonomics. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, you, you, but it's that, is that really refined stuff of, you know, ah, did I smack, you know, did I, I, I maybe wouldn't have known I'll smack my elbow on the inside of the tank or something when I turn it or, you know, I don't know, right, something like right. that, um, which even if you had an ergonomics bark, it wouldn't tell you those things. Uh, and so for instance, like with your example about the interior, um, you know, you, you can, you, you can move, you can move your arm and touch buttons and stuff and you don't necessarily have to touch a button to check that it's within reach like it's a kind of a nice to have to have that feedback um but um but yeah i mean i think there will be this for, certainly for the time being there's always going to be this uh analog validation um but to be but you know it's great to do that because that's where we do all the really beautiful surface refinement anyway um mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know we can we can only really take it so far in gravity sketch uh, i mean i get better and better I, I can sense that i'm getting better and better at it um, as time goes on, but um, you know, people always will always say there's no substitute for clay, and to, to a certain degree, I can I can I can empathise with that and say or uh, agree with that and just say, yeah, that like last one millimeter, two millimeter of, of surface refinement uh, and validation is uh, is definitely worth doing as a full size clay model. I've talked enough. I'll give Nico a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle, are you trying to say something really quick? Yeah, I was going to say that I want to make sure that we leave some time for the audience. So, Nico, if you have a question, feel free to do so, and then we'll we'll read some of the ones from the audience. Yeah, basically, my question, really quick, just picking back off of the, the thing you were just saying about the last one to two millimeters uh, for refinement. Do you find when you, like, if you take a... Um, a model from VR and kind of get it to a pretty finished surfacing versus uh, clay. Do you find uh, that you can get pretty close with the, the data output from Gravity Sketch to something that is visually really nice um, compared to like that last one to two millimeters that you might be working in clay? Um, can you get can you get really really close with the with the output and and or within VR what you visualize is it pretty like pretty pretty spot on to the it's, final it's astonishingly close um for anybody who's seen data on a flat mon uh, flat monitor and milled it out and felt that gap in their understanding about what they thought it was going to look like and what it actually looks like um for in gravity to go from gravity sketch into into a milled model I mean, when you you see it being milled and it's so familiar it just looks exactly like the model you've been looking at for the last you know, a couple of weeks or, or however long you've you've been working on it. Um, yeah, it's 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 really. I mean, just because this is you've got that same human perspective in one to one. Um, it, it's yeah, it's it, it's really exactly the same. It just feels like the same. The only the only 
every time we do it, we're learning and learning a, a little bit more. Uh, like for example, now, so so we just presented a we just presented a show bike, um, a Brixton um, Brixton store five hundred at the Eichma motorcycle uh, show. It was done all in VR, uh, and then we milled out the clay model. Um, but what we what we'd messed up, uh, or what we hadn't quite gotten right, was the you know, the top of the fuel tank because our eye pers- our, our eye point wasn't controlled enough. So my eyes is is one meter seventy off the floor, say, and so I wasn't always looking at that model with my eyes exactly at the right place. Maybe I was looking at it at one meter fifty, for example. And uh, and I was looking and thinking, okay, yeah, this was this is good. But actually, when you put your eyes at the right place, then it looks a bit different. You know, the, the top of the tank looked a little bit low and such like. So now we learn from that, and now we know, okay, we need to we need to make uh, a couple of lines that we can. When when I line up those two lines with the horizon uh, at one meter seventy off the floor, then actually my eye point is correct, and now I'm perceiving the model correctly. And then you know that's so everything's learning. Everything's learning, but. Um, uh, but yeah, but really, when we mill it out, it's it's fantastic. And so, yeah, for that particular model, we we did do some some uh, I would say some 10, 15 millimeter moves uh, of the clay model. Um, but typically, you know, I would say it, it's it has the potential to to cut down on those uh, dramatically. So would you say would you say like the need for refinement? You kind of you can lower the need for refinement or the time that you need for refinement. You can get so close. That at a point you're you're saving quite a bit of time. Yeah, I mean it saves a ton of time. I mean really, it's it's time saving, cost saving, everything. And you know there will be there's, there's probably a lot of guys out there who uh, who try to you know not do the clay modeling process. And uh, you know normally you know you can walk around. You can, I can walk around a motorcycle show and I can see which models have been done with the clay process and which guys have, which ones have just been done um, in a flat monitor uh process because you can just tell from the surfacing and so but now with gravity sketch you can actually you know you can just can you, can, get you so tell much which ones, can you tell which ones have been done with the gravity sketch process <laughs> no because because as far as i know there is only two there's a, there's the malaguti xtm which was just uh, launched at the eichma and there was the brixton store um i, I don't i'd love to know which which other ones have been done uh, in gravity sketch but uh I think you, I think you won't be able to tell because the the surfacing so sophisticated, um, and actually, you know, I think we're at the start of, a, of a, a creative explosion that's going to happen because gravity sketch enables such creative leaps to be made or or try. You can try without penalty. That actually, um, you know, people are going to try stuff and you know, and then they'll knock it back to the fifty percent, you know, feasibility for manufacturing or whatever. So we're going to see, you know, even more interesting things. Um, coming, I think, in the future. Right. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll read some of the questions from the audience. So Jorge Telles says, what was the hardest part of the transition from clay to VR? What are the challenges or what is missing? Hmm. What was the hardest part? Um I don't know what the hardest part was having to be being at home every day with my wife. <laughs> I joke, of course. And this, is, this has been amazing, actually, for for us as well, um, to be together all the time. Um, and um, yeah, you know, we really had to learn how to communicate, which is it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, the hardest part it hasn't really been a hard thing, I guess. Giving up clay, which is, you know, I loved that process, but it was a means. To, it was always a means to an end. Um, you know, I'm a clay, I'm a design sculptor. What it was just clay was the best means we had of sculpting design. And now I've been given this kind of uh, this new tool, and and so um, yeah, it's so I don't I, I don't really think I've missed anything. And um, and sorry, what was the second part of your question? Um, what are the challenges, or or what is missing in the VR process? What's missing? Yeah, I don't know what's missing. Um, mm, I, yeah, I don't really know what's missing. To be quite honest with you, like I, I, I just I look forward to the possibilities. Like for example, ability to do like CFD, uh, computational fluid fluid dynamics. I think uh, so. Like aerodynamics. Like so, for example, if you could if you could in, bring some of those things in. Like so, when you're you're working on a on a, a surface, you know, you can already see how that affects the dynamic uh, the 
the the aerodynamics, for example, that would be incredible. So I don't think it was missing. I think now just I see that there is huge possibilities um, that we could ne we never even dreamed of that were possible before, um, but invariably are going to become possible um, going forwards. And so, um, yeah, I'm not missing anything. I'm I'm I only feel you know treat it like I I feel like a kid in a kid in a candy store really because uh, everything's so brilliant. Uh, nice. What's your pipeline be be beyond Gravity Sketch? For example, which packages are you using to combine the output from Gravity Sketch with scan data and precision engineering geometry? Um, so beyond Gravity Sketch, is if we you know if we're going to a clay model, uh, then we're doing that refinement again, and we're gonna we scan that. Um, but through whichever means, whenever we get to the point where we say this is our final design, um, so whether it's you know an output. I just from Gravity Sketch or a scanned uh, clay model that will then go into Alias. So we're still using uh, Alias to do uh, you know that, that refinement of surfaces. Um, we can use actually you know we've had instances where we use the Alias uh, surface diagnostic tools. Um, not, not me personally, but I have a I have a colleague who who, who uses Alias sub D very proficiently, and so he can use those surface diagnostic tools to actually refine my sub D model even better in alias um, but uh, yeah I mean so we typically we go to uh, to an alias uh, NURBS process uh, and then I actually get to, rather than me trying to look at it on the screen uh, I don't have an alias license for example so it's difficult for me to see uh, he will send me an OBJ a high fidelity OBJ and I can bring that into gravity sketch and then he can be in gravity sketch as well so my alias guy is in uh, is in uh, Belgrade And uh, and so he, he could come in and we could be together looking at the the highlights together I and mean, you know we can we can talk about oh you see this highlight here it's kind of dropping uh, this should be more like this shape and so he can get a real understanding of of uh, back you know back and forth with me so um, and then you know engineering wise um, but I guess we, I don't. I don't have enough experience of it yet. I would say, like, I'm not really. I think when it gets kicked downstream, um, you know, we haven't really been through a full A class uh, process where it's been so much back and forth. Um, but you know, these VR tools do enable that communication uh, very well. Um, one challenge I've faced is presenting a VR concept to a live audience. Uh, it's not the same experience for the audience as it would be in a clay model in the room. Where do you see that going to bridge virtual rea uh, virtual to reality presentations? So you, is that, um, I mean, I don't know if someone's written the question, so maybe we won't be able to refine it. But um, within, gra within Gravity Sketch, presenting in Gravity Sketch is, is really powerful. Um, and I think the, I, I guess, well, maybe this does hark back to the, to one problem actually is getting, um, like high level stakeholders, uh, who, you know, they can, they know how to walk into a room and look at a clay model and it's simple, but having them, taking them out of that kind of comfort zone into, into VR and having them having to look at uh, a clay model, uh, sorry, a VR model, uh, and navigate around it, um, is a little bit of a, of a, of a barrier to be honest. And I, I wonder sometimes, you know, if if that if that's part of the reason why they're not being adopted, just because they don't have the the level of comfort um, and they don't want to look silly in front of their in front of their uh, subordinate, really. Um, but um, I mean, personally, I've, I, I've I found it only amazing to be able to present because um, you know it means we've got clients uh, all around the world, and we can all come together around the model and regularly and you know so you can have checks like every week for example whereas typically if your client was a long way away you might not be able to get a check in with them uh until six weeks or eight weeks later uh, and then you're going to learn oh we should have done this differently we should have done that differently so the you know the the information flow that happens uh in these these checks is, is very important for you know to get to the the final solution uh more efficiently So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Nemo, do you have one last question before we jump out? Yeah. Um, so if you look, I'm, I'm going to speak in automotive terms just because I'm a bit more familiar, but you'll understand the phenomenon that I'm explaining is if you look at um, industrial design, 
in the automotive design, uh, typically as tools got better and as techniques got better in design, uh, the design language evolved. Uh, you go into the 60s, you had these beautiful sculptural cars. You go in the 70s, you mm -hmm. start to see the wedge cars. Uh, in the 80s, everything was boxy. Coming into the 90s, organic design, just a perfect example there. What type of design do you see being unlocked through tools like Gravity Sketch? Uh, I have hmm. very strong opinions on this, but being that you're from a motorcycle background, I think you would have a unique insight that I'd love to hear. I honestly don't know. I have to say, I, I'm, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. Okay. Uh, typically, just basically because I'm, you know, I have a background in design, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a design sculptor now. And, and so the reason why I moved to design sculpting is because I recognize that whilst I could manifest designs beautifully, other people had just had way better ideas than me uh, in, in form. Um, so I don't know. I think I think that's a that's a design kind of question, and uh, and I'm not really qualified to answer it. I'm afraid. Um, but I th but I think people will experiment more. Uh, and th you know we're at this at this point with AI and you know Mid Journey and all that stuff where people are uh, you know the stuff I see coming out of Mid Journey with the sketches that are going in. And the permutations of those sketches are just phenomenal. And I'm, and I'm looking at these and I'm like, yep, they all work. Yep, yep, they all work. And, you know, some of the sketches I see from designers, you're like, you know, that doesn't really work in 3D. I'm going to have to kind of figure that out. But actually, so, yeah, there's some really high quality output from these AI um, systems. And, and I think, yeah, just that's going to that's gonna, uh, have a massive impact on the, on the kind of design thinking and um, and then, you know, hopefully, hopefully I still have a career. Hopefully it doesn't manifest itself as as 3D modeling uh, too much. Uh, I don't I, I, I typically don't worry about these uh, AI tools replacing uh, what we do, uh, but just uh, really turbocharging them um, and uh, yeah, so making it faster, easier um, and more ubiquitous. All right. I mean, we awesome. We're. We've run out of time, but I do want to ask this last question because I think it's important for people to have this conversation and just give each other tips. So this is from Michele. Ciao, guys. I have a simple question. Maybe I already answered. The hardest thing I find in VR is being able to stand long sessions. Do you have any tips, suggestions, timing suggestions, etc.? Plus, do you feel your eyes sight suffers after the session? Um. I haven't struggled with it, honestly. Um, and I've, you know, the, the Quest 2 with an elite head strap is so comfortable. Like, so if you go from a Quest 2 with the elastic head strap and then uh, put the elite head strap on, it is night and day in terms of comfort. Um, and actually, honestly, so I now have the Quest Pro. And yes, although the, the resolution's marginally better, I don't think it's 1,800 euros better. And I find it significantly more com more uncomfortable because it's just resting um, kind of here on my forehead. Um, yeah, I haven't had any problems with discomfort at all. No vertigo. Um, I typically, I wear glasses in you know in the real world, uh, but I don't have to wear glasses in uh, in Gravity Sketch. Uh, it's all fine. Yeah, I, I, honestly, time time just disappears when I'm in here, and, and I can be in for many many hours uh, very comfortably. Uh, and sometimes I, I really need to remind myself of that because, uh, you know, if I'm teaching students and, and we're doing six, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm saying, hey, guys, we're going to do six hours today. I need to kind of, because I'm so comfortable, uh, I need to remember that maybe not everybody is that comfortable. Uh, and so kind of to try and take regular breaks. Um, but uh, I hope, uh, yeah, I hope everyone can find kind of a, comf a comfortable way of using it. Um, I, I I don't. I, I've never experienced any problems. I've read all the tips, like you know, get a get a bottle with a with a straw so you can take regular drinks and, and that kind of a thing. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's it's as comfortable as being in the real world. All right, and yeah, Nico has also put together um, you know um, some material around comfort in VR. So we'll make sure to to post it on the chat and also if. If any of you has any other tips or things that have worked for you, feel free to just post it on the chat. And, you know, the idea is for all of us to kind of like share 
share this information so that we can all get more comfortable in these new technologies. Mm-hmm.